So borderline, Damien, we got to just understand a couple basic numbers. And what we had here was an individual who owned uh, a single member LLC. And that does become important. And it does take away a tiny bit of the impact uh, of the case, but not to the point where it's still not really interesting. And so he's got this single member LLC and he wants to go out and acquire a hospital. And so the single member LLC is gonna be the owner of the hospital. It needs some cash to go out and buy the hospital. And um, it goes looking for a bank to lend, right? But to borrow this $9.9 million they need to, borrow, uh, to uh, buy the hospital, they utilize this government program. And the government program basically says like, hey, lender, go ahead and, and loan this $9.9 million to the single member LLC and we'll, you know, we'll give you a backup guarantee if things go bad. And so because of that, the bank loans to the single member LLC on what we call a non-recourse basis. When we say the bank lent to the single member LLC on a non-recourse basis, what we mean is the only option the bank had with the single member LLC if the loan went bad is to take the property and sell it at auction and pocket the cash. So if the bank was owned, owed $9.9 million and the property value goes down to six, the only thing the bank can do is take the property, sell it, pocket six, and then they're out $3.9 million. Now, that's going to become a very important concept later when we get into the, the Duffy case. And so you've got this non-recourse loan to the single member LLC that the federal government is saying, hey, don't worry, lender, we're going to give you right, a guarantee. But then the government goes to Bordelon, the owner of the single member LLC, and says, we're not going to be on the hook for this thing. The only way we're going to you know, allow the bank to make this loan via this program is for you, Bordelon, the individual, to personally guarantee the loan. So Bordelon says, all right, I'll do what I got to do. And so the way the loan ultimately flushed out, the bank didn't even have to pursue the single member LLC first if it didn't want to. It could come straight to Bordelon, the individual owner, and say, I want my $9.9 .9 million back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the uh, hospital gets acquired. It kicks off a loss in 2008, you know, like 1.6 million bucks flows through on Borderline's return, obviously, because it's a single member LLC, so it's just filed in a Schedule C, and Borderline just says, I'll use that loss to offset other sources of income. So, why do we care about any of this? Because look, right, if you want a quick indication of the complexity inherent in the tax law, it's, you know, anytime we're doing a 1040 and the individual gets a, a loss, whether it's from a Schedule C or a pass-through entity, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, we have four different loss limitations under current law, right? First, you have to have basis if you're in a flow-through entity, for example. Uh, then you have to be at risk, which is what we're going to talk about now. And then you have to get through the passive activity rules of 469, which we'll talk about next. And then starting again in 2021, you know, that provision that makes absolutely no economic sense, we got to deal with 461L again. Um, but... So the idea is we have all these loss and limitations and with a, a single member LLC, we don't have this basis concern, right? Because obviously any, any money the single member LLC has came from you or it was borrowed. So we move on to the second loss limitation, which basically just says, look, if you're going to use losses, um, you know, you, you can take them against debt as long as you are at risk for that debt. And so when we say at risk, right? It's we mostly see this in true partnership context where Damien and I are 50 50 partners and the partnership goes out and borrows some money. And just by virtue of Section 752, you and I, you know, we get to increase our basis by our share of that debt. But if that debt is, as we described before, non recourse either to the partnership or to us, where we have limited legal liability. We're never going to be called upon to pay the debts of that partnership. Then while we might have basis for those amounts, we are not at risk for those amounts. And so Bordelon, the IRS came in and challenged the loss and said, hey, this $9.9 .9 million that the single member LLC borrowed that you guaranteed, you are not at risk for that amount. And once I saw that in a case, I'm like, no matter what happens this year, this is going to end up in my top 10 because we don't understand enough about what it truly means to be at risk.
okay? So, um, what does it mean to be at risk for a debt? Well, you really have two hurdles you have to dance through, okay? Um, unless you fit into one of these exceptions. And what they're looking for is to be, under 465B2A, personally liable for a debt, right? And so if Damien's going to claim he's at risk for debt, the point is, if everything goes bad uh, for the, the true borrower of that debt, Damien's going to have to come out of pocket <laughs> and pay that liability. Right, yeah. So first, you have to be personally liable for it. Now, we have some exceptions to that. The one people are probably most familiar with is the concept of you know, qualified non-recourse debt, where if you have a true kind of mortgage on real property that's used in an activity of holding real property, even if it's non-recourse, even if you don't bear any personal responsibility for the debt, you, know, you, you get to treat it as being at risk. But even that, I think, is a much more narrow exception than our industry probably realizes. I think we probably treat a lot of debt as QNR that isn't QNR. I think you're right. That's one I know that I'm always looking out for because I think it's not, it, can you trust when, you're, when you get the K-1 or not that it's, it's reported that way? And do you know if it is or not? That, that those, are, those are the questions I'm always asking. <laughs> My experience has been people think any true, any just conventional mortgage is QNR, and it's not right. how it works. It's gotta no. be in the right type of activity, right? Now here, we're not dealing with QNR. So um, we, we really do have to ask the question, was Borderline personally liable for the debt? And um, we'll talk about how they make that determination. But people have to understand there's then a second requirement where even if Damien has to pay a debt if everything goes bad, if Damien could then recover his payment from either the original borrower or like some other partner like me or something like that. If there's something that protects your loss, then you're not at risk for that amount. And so what we learn here in this case that I thought was so interesting is like, yeah, look, there's a two-step approach to determining if we are at risk for a loan. Number one, are we personally liable for it? Are we going to have to pay it if everything goes bad? And number two, if we do have to pay it, can we get made whole by somebody else, okay? So in Bordelon, what they do, right, is when I say they, the IRS takes a very simplistic approach to it. They say, hold on a second, this is an open and shut case. A single member LLC borrowed this money and an LLC has the words limited liability in it. Mm -hmm. And so as the owner of a single member LLC, you don't have obligation for the liabilities of the partnership, case closed. You know, while in theory that might be true, right, we know um, that you can make an LLC's liability at risk to you by, right, something like guaranteeing it. Now, uh, we learned years ago in a case called Brand that simply guaranteeing a debt doesn't make it at risk. And it actually is because of the reason we talked about before is because just because you guarantee it, usually the way the law works is if a partnership bails on a debt and you as a partner pay it, you have a right to recover that payment from the partnership, right? Like those rights of subrogation where you could say, I'm going to be made whole. But then in a case called Abramson, the court said, well, look, you know, there are situations where a guarantor will pay debt and maybe they even have a right of of reimbursement from someone else. But if that right of reimbursement isn't particularly meaningful, if they're not going to collect from anybody, then, you know, we uh, will acknowledge that that guarantee gives you at risk basis. And so we have this two step approach that, again, I want people to, to conceptualize 465 B2A and then B4. B2A, you better be on the hook for that liability. And then B4, you can't be made whole from somebody else. So how do you decide you are you know, on the hook for a liability? Well, this is where, in this case, right, the, the kind of um, single member LLC nature makes it pretty unique. What they do in the courts is they pretend. They pretend like, you know, everything goes real bad inside the partnership. So all the assets become completely worthless and all the liabilities become due, but the liabilities can't be paid because there's no assets, so who ends up holding the bag? And so they looked at that in the case of Bordelon and said, well, wait, Bordelon personally guaranteed the debt. There was no other right primary obligor. 
And so the only other person borderline could conceivably, you know, recover from in theory is, well, the only other guarantor, I should say, was the federal government. But the federal government made clear in their deal with borderline that, hey, if we got to pay this, you got to pay us back. So under a hypothetical analysis where the debt went bad and all the assets were worthless, no matter how you followed the cash, it was going to be coming out of borderline's pocket. Okay. And so he satisfied that B2A requirement because, you know, there's no one else that's going to be around to pay the liability. But then people need to understand that B4 applies a 465. And even if you were to pay a debt, if you could turn around and recover from someone else, it would be, you know, you wouldn't be at risk for that amount. Now, in this situation, again, it makes it unique because when you have a single member LLC, what the case says, and I think this is useful from a go forward perspective, is look, the cases, the two tests I should say are pretty much one and the same. Because in the first test you're asking who ends up left holding the bag uh, if the debt isn't paid by the single member LLC. And in the second you're asking, well, who can you recover from? And think about it, right? If, if we had a multi-member partnership and I was a limited partner and Damien, you're the general partner, I can guarantee a debt, but if I pay that guarantee under state law, you're the general partner. I can knock down on your door and say, pay me back. But if it's a single member LLC, the only person I could conceivably recover from is the single member LLC. And who is the single member LLC? It's me, right? right the only right. single member LLC is going to get any cash to pay me back is if I put the cash in. And so they, you know, when you look at it that way, they say, well, wait a minute, right? No matter what the cash is coming from you, and if you're gonna be made whole from anybody, it's gonna be from the single member LLC, and the cash is still gonna be coming from you. And so the court said to the IRS, like, yeah, I get it that this started out as an LLC, but when he personally guaranteed that debt and couldn't look to anyone else to pay it back, not the partnership, or not the single member LLC, not the federal government, um, then it became at risk to him because 465B2A, he would have to pay the guarantee. 465B4, couldn't get made whole from anybody else. Now, the other thing that makes this case interesting that I want to make sure listeners understand is he was never paid, called upon to pay this guarantee. The hospital, the debt, everything was fully healthy, right? The debt was fully collateralized. It was extremely unlikely he would ever have to pay the guarantee. That's not what's important. And the IRS tried to make that argument like, hey, look, this guarantee is meaningless because it's collateralized, it's doing well. That's not how 465 works. They work through a hypothetical situation where those assets become worthless. Who ends up paying the debt? And in that case, it was borderline. So he's at risk. He gets to use the $1.6 million loss. So yeah, the case would be a little more interesting if instead of just borderline, it was borderline Damien and Tony and we had to analyze you know, could he be reimbursed from somebody else? But there's still some really good nuggets to take away from that. Number one, we don't understand enough about 465. So if you can read about it, read about it. But number two, to me, the more long lasting impact of this case is that when you have a wholly owned entity, the two tests of 465 B2A and B4 just kind of meld together. Because if you're gonna find under B2A that the owner is the only one left to pay the liability, then under B4, you're naturally going to say there's no one to be reimbursed from because the entity is you, right? So it's not like my GPLP example from before. So yeah, that's our first case of the year. Um, not because it's the most important, but because we'll build on it in later cases. Yeah. And, and I guess maybe two things kind of strike me as I'm, as I'm listening to you here, you know, and, and kind of go through it, which I, I agree. I mean, I think there there definitely is a lot of, of uh, additional learning we we could do on on uh, 465 and at risk in general. But I, I feel like in this current environment that we're in, perhaps in some of the downturn and the year that we've seen and and had, that perhaps we're going to see that come up a bit more. Obviously, because you, you you're more concerned about it when you have losses, and and obviously with the CARES Act and all that and the opportunities we had to carry back losses. I mean, those have kind of become moot if we don't have. If we don't have basis and then we don't have, and we're not at risk. So yeah, it just seems like something we're probably going to see come up a lot more. I, I have to think. Yeah. You know, where else the at risk rules are going to be important, buddy is um, opportunity zones. Mm, yeah. you, you inherently start with a zero basis and your only basis can come from debt. And so people are going to be losing, using losses against debt basis. 
But as we said, that's only step one. Step two, you got to be at risk. Now, most of your ozone debt is probably going to be qualified non-recourse debt, but True. you can never say for sure, right? Um, like we said, a lot of a lot of activities aren't going to meet that um, that determination. So, yeah, we'll see at risk become pretty prominent again. And just so people understand, like why at risk exists, it, it makes sense. It's been around since '76, but like once we establish that we get basis when we buy something with non-recourse debt, right? The, the, there was an old joke, something akin to like, you know, what do you call it when, when seven doctors get together to buy a, a you know, property and it's called a tax shelter, right? Because <laughs> they, they, they buy it using non-recourse debt and they'd have debt basis and then they take losses and then they never pay that debt back, you know, but they got those losses. So the ability to take losses against non-recourse debt used to be abused um, wholeheartedly. And so that's why they added in these at-risk rules because they're just saying, look, we know you can take basis uh, losses against basis under step one, but step two, we're going to limit abuse by making sure you actually have some skin in the game, like you are at risk, personally liable for these debts. So yeah, we'll, we'll see more of it. Um, but it, it's something where, like I said, I think as an industry, a lot of us see 465 or, or, you know, look at the forms on the, on the tax return and just say, eh, I'm trusting that the software's got it right. And I don't know that that's, uh, the case. <laughs> 